Our next speaker is Sid Visser from SJ Geophysics. His talk is, is titled Volterra Borehole TDEM Surface TDEM and 3D IP Test Surveys Over the Lawler Deposit. Uh, Sid received his BSc from, or, yeah, BSc from UBC. He started with Cominco, and after a variety of events, uh, he started SJ Geophysics. Uh, SJ Geophysics offers a wide variety of services throughout the world, including Kazakhstan, Ghana, Mongolia, and Mexico. And from what I understand, late December, he usually gives out presents to good girls and boys. Where is it? Uh, so um, I'm having a little problem here, the same problem I have with uh, most of uh, my geophysical ideas is uh, I don't use PowerPoint, I try to do something different and I, d I get the same remarks with my uh, uh, geophysics ideas as we've done it this way for 20 years, why should we change? Uh, so uh, the animations that I put into this slideshow don't work because it's now a PDF. Microsoft wouldn't import my LibreOffice files. Anyway, um, we uh, tried a number of times to get in there to do this survey in the winter time, but we ended up doing it in uh, July of uh, this year. And uh, in nine days, we did a uh, surface uh, uh, EM test, a borehole EM test. And while we had the equipment there, we thought we might as well do some uh, IP. And while we had the IP array laid out, we decided to leave it overnight and try some empty. Uh, so this is uh, the sign of the project going there. And right off the bat, I'd like to thank uh, Peter and his staff for the support during the test survey. And uh, my two technicians and geophysicists uh, who did all the swamp work for me. Uh, again, the animation doesn't work, so I, everything is up here. People ask me what uh, Volterra imaging uh, system is. And what's the, what's the pointer work here? Yeah, it's a green one. So it's, it's basically uh, the whole uh, design of uh, survey philosophies. And the big thing is uh, we would like to customize surveys to meet project objectives. Unfortunately, this doesn't always fit with the clients or the geologist objectives, but uh, we try and do that. And then we uh, build our own acquisition systems because we uh, decided that off-the-shelf systems didn't really work for what we were uh, trying to do. And then we do advanced interpretation and modeling, naturally with a lot of help from the geologists. And it's very interesting in this, uh, these talks here that we had such nice, uh, good geological talks instead of just geophysics talks. Um, our main acquisition unit is uh, what we call our uh, dab tube. And this is the acquisition unit here with uh, some batteries attached. And we can attach more batteries to leave it uh, run overnight. And it runs on its, kind of on its own. We can attach it to uh, coils, so we can do time domain, CSA, MT, MT kind of surveys with coils, or we can attach it to galvanic sources. Basically, we can attach it to just about any source you want. Uh, it can be also, I made it uh, uh, round and uh, long like that so I could stuff it inside of a borehole unit. And as we can see here, we got the same system into a borehole unit, which makes uh, it a uh, lot lighter and smaller. We can get away from those big cables. This winching cable here for a 1.5 kilometer hole weighs less than 20 kilos. Uh, we can also, we run it, uh, start it up and run it and monitor it uh, using um, a cell phone or a tablet. And we do timing with a, with a tablet, so it's pretty easy to use. Uh, during the summer, and actually we, uh, some of the problems in this survey and concerns was, is uh, we couldn't really get around with snowmobiles, although we didn't have to worry about them running us over on the roads. Uh, this is kind of the historic loop that was put out, and as you can see now, there was a, there's a nice road cutting right across the deposit there, and this is where all the uh, mining activity is, and they naturally had to put it right on the other side there. 
And on top of that, they put a nice power line through there too. So there's a power line now going right over top of the deposit and it was very active when we were there. So I didn't really want to put the front of the loop so close to the power line to have it coupled with it. I don't know how well it was grounded. So we uh, thought about putting a loop out like this. You go around it and that would couple well too because it's dipping down this way so the coupling would be uh, extremely good that way and the power line noise would be probably less. Unfortunately, these guys were, uh, uh, wouldn't let us go past, so we decided to do it the easy way and just put the wire underneath the power line on the road. Oh, just going back, this is the uh, hole that uh, Dave Coop talked about the other day, this uh, dub 33 and that's the hole we uh, surveyed also and uh, it was nice to see that the data looks similar that's the first time i've seen that result uh, so the other thing was it was uh, rumored that the amplitude of the results were very low and it was a very weak response so i looked at what we could do to to help that well one thing would be to make more sensitive data loggers, which I think we got under control. Better signal processing can always increase the signal processing, can get better. But I think we got a good handle on that. Then I uh, decided to look at uh, sensors, longer stacking, and naturally what everybody loves is the bigger hammer. That's the way to go. You know, get a bigger transmitter, we can see deeper. It's easy to sell too. So let's look at the. Um, at the coils, I think you've seen this uh, picture before that Dennis showed, but he kind of concentrated on this really low frequency end. Well, we don't very often work there. We work kind of between 1 hertz and 10 kilohertz. This yellow line down here is the low temperature. This, uh, this was done in Utah a couple years ago, these uh, test surveys, so that's what this data is from. This low temperature, yellow line is a low temperature squid. And as we can see, that's the low temperature. That's not the high temperature. The high temperature one sits up there more. The, as we can see, we can also buy coils that follow this same noise level right down to about one hertz. After that, maybe the, 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 they get better. On the other extreme, we see the flux gate sensors, which at the higher frequencies are, are, are quite horrible. And in between, we have, we have other coils. At the low end, though, the flux gates start getting closer to the, to the other system. So if you, if you look at stacking, here's a quick example of stacking. If we take some synthetic uh, signal with a bunch of noise on it, with no stacking, and if we stack that by 100 times for 10 times signal improvement, then if we look at what that happens to the signal of the magnetometer, it starts getting into the range of the... Uh, of the coil, so we got to stack at least 100 times. If we stack it 10,000 times more, then we get right into where, where the coils are sitting, but then we quickly run into a time issue. If we, if we look at this, if we, uh, if the signal of the noise, we want to improve it by about four times, if we usually look at a one minute reading, then we got to record for about 16 minutes. If we want to improve it by about 16 times, we're up to 256 minutes and it quickly kind of disappears where you better be looking at years. So then there's the bigger hammer approach. Well, that's, that's an easy one. So let's say we uh, have a 20 ohm loop and say we're transmitting at a small eight amps at 160 volts. It takes about a 1.2 kilowatt uh, transmitter, which I can run with a little two kilowatt Honda, which I can easily lift onto the back of a truck and carry around. If we want to go four times that signal, then, then we're up into the, uh, into the 32 amp range. Then we've got to have a 640 volt transmitter. And all of a sudden, our wattage for the transmitter goes up to a 20 kilowatt transmitter. And we need about a 30, 40 kilowatt generator to run that. A little bit more than I can lift into the back of a pickup. So I'm getting old and my back's getting weak. So I like the smaller ones. So we did a compromise. So we decided to go with a small transmitter, transmit about eight amps, and we decided to go with multiple sensors, coils, and magnetometers, and stack for about 15 minutes. 
So here's some of the results from that. I didn't really have time to model it or really uh, get any of the noise out of it. I just, base, this is really basic processing. Uh, we plot it very similar to the UTM. We have uh, gates very similar to the UTM. We uh, have the gates starting at the late time and going back, except I use square root of two instead of two. But this is the basic results. And as the loop is right in here. Right in here, this is continuously normalized. This is point normalized. And there's no doubt that, that you see the conductor. You see some, this is line 176 that goes right over the deposit. And this is the results from 184. And uh, as you can see, there's some early times, earlier time stuff in here, near surface stuff. And, but generally speaking, you're definitely seeing the anomaly. This is kind of an interesting feature on, the, on channel one, is there's a 30 meter error in elevation of two different GPS is used. I have no idea why that's there, but there's a 30, and I haven't corrected for it yet, but there's a 30 meter change in two different GPSs. And this is the uh, data from the flux gate, and this is the vertical component, and this is the horizontal component. This, again, you can, you can see it pretty clearly. So now to go over to the borehole system. While I was there, I also surveyed one borehole. I surveyed it with uh, two different probes just to compare uh, probes. Uh, it takes me about four, four or five hours to survey, uh, survey a hole. This is a hole that's about 600 to 800 meters uh, away from the uh, main conductive zone. So just to explain my uh, borehole system, we designed our own borehole system, again, because I got tired of the big heavy cables that we had to lug around and were hard to ship. So basically, I stuck our receiver into, the, into a borehole tube, two battery tubes, and we have a very sensitive B-field coil on one end, an actual coil for, to take actual measurements, and we had put stick the flux gate on the other end to get the uh, cross component. It fits into this uh, nice gun case that's 100 centimeters long. It weighs, the whole total weight is about 30 kilos, so you can take it as ex excess baggage on an airplane. We can also attach it with these extension rods onto a, um, a, onto a core tube head assembly, so we can actually stick it through the bottom of the rods and through a drill hole, and we can uh, survey a live hole. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can, instead of the coils, we can attach an IP receiver cable and uh, do downhole IP surveys, and we don't have the coupling problems with the cable going to the surface. So this is uh, very portable. We took it into the hole on the back of this big boss, and if we had, wouldn't have done that, if we strip it right down, we could actually carry it into the hole. So this is uh, Ryan putting the... Uh, borehole probe together and uh, sticking it down the hole. Again, you can see our winch and cable there. That's a 1.5 uh, kilometer cable there, weighs about uh, 20 kilos, the cable and winch. So here's the results from that hole. It looks very similar to what Dave uh, showed, except it's cleaner. Uh, <laughs> you can see the, um, the early time in-hole response here and uh, the late time out-of-hole response. This noise up here, I kind of think is that uh, we've seen it on both probes, so I think it could be actually uh, real. I haven't looked close enough at the uh, geological logs to see what could uh, cause that. Uh, this is the uh, uh, same results from the uh, flux gate and mags. We don't really see as good a late time results here. Also, I haven't calibrated the flux gates at all, so. It definitely, they probably require some uh, better calibration, but it's really hard to get calibration information from the manufacturer, so I probably have to do it myself. Uh, this is the uh, flux gate cross components. I'm not going to spend any time on it, except that we definitely see it with that. And uh, just back a little bit is the noise near surface here is because the hole is pretty vertical near surface and we only use the accelerometers for correcting the rotation so it's pretty hard to do when you've got a vertical hole so we've got to think up some other methods there. Uh, again comparison of the uh, the B field coil and the mag is this late time response you, s you see right in here doesn't really show up there and the, one of the reasons for it could be is the uh, noise. If you compare the noise to the uh, of the B coil and the mags, 
you see that this spiky noise here in part of the survey, you're looking at about 0 0.02 picotassel of noise. Really, really, really nice clean data. Where with the, with the flux gate mags, you're looking at about one picotassel. So the anomaly was about uh, three picotassel. So with the mags, you're, you're getting close to being into the noise of the, of the system. So with longer stacking, you could probably take that out a bit. But uh, uh, when you're down the borehole, it's kind of hard to stack longer. The, uh, the other thing is to look at the raw data. You can really see the difference. What really surprised me is this is one kilometer down the borehole. And look at the power line noise that's, that's still in the, at one kilometer down. That kind of surprised me when I looked at it. But you can see the, huh? Okay, you can see the, so I'll quickly go through this. This is another thing we could collect temperature and we can also collect uh, magnetometer data. So, uh, so I don't think we really need squid magnetometers. We don't need a high power transmitters and the flux gates are likely good as a second uh, system for doing a survey, but not the initial one. Now to quickly go on to IP survey we did, this is the IP survey I had planned where every one of these short lines is a, would be a receiver dipole and the red lines would be uh, currents. Unfortunately, uh, the helpers provided us by Hut Bay all of a sudden had to run off to do another job. So that left us with three people. And so we cut the survey back down significantly. We still collected uh, 1,170 data points with three people in one day, which is uh, not bad. I just came back from a job in Arizona, by the way, where we collected 6,500 data points in one day with a little bit bigger crew, but pretty large amount of data. So uh, Ross was uh, nice enough to QC this for me, and you can see we had some real nice de decay curves and there's another way dot plots. We can also look at the dot plots in 3D to make sure that our data is fairly good. And then um, Brian was nice enough to do the uh, inversion for me. And this is in the inversion of the IP software. And what's really interesting, we get this really low resistivity uh, sitting right on top of the, the b deposit. I'm not sure why it's on top, whether there's alteration. I just really should talk to the geologist uh, about this. It could also be that our survey is just a little bit too small and that we can't force the uh, solution down, which is also a a uh, very likely scenario. It's got a very high resistivity zone near the surface. And then if you add the chargeability, it's the same thing. We get a chargeability high sitting kind of right over top of the deposit. It's a little lower than the resistivity, but still sitting there. And as, as you can see, you can also see some near surface uh, chargeability, which, which confirms that the EM data, we, they do have some uh, EM signatures near surface, whether it's graphite or some sulfites, I'm not sure. And if you combine them together, this is kind of the picture you get. So there's definitely a resistivity low and chargeability high located uh, directly above the deposit. What it exactly means, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's due to too small survey or what, what it is. I'd like to talk more to the geologists about that. Uh, and then uh, since we had this IP array out, we decided we might as well uh, try some IP. And uh, so here's us setting up uh, some coils. We had the coils with us, so we set up the coils and we just let it run overnight. But we ran out of time and actually money to look at the data. So we're not in competition with you yet, Phoenix. But <laughs> <laughs> it's a real good time for you to go there if you like water and mosquitoes so to do your summer survey. So that's... Questions? Yeah, I, I, uh, 
I actually did, I probably forgot to mention is I used a base frequency of uh, five hertz here. So I didn't go quite that late in, in time. Uh, I just picked that frequency because I, uh, the modeling I did showed that I could probably see it at, at that base frequency, but I could easily go lower too. Pardon? Back up here. That's that's from the uh, the latest channel shown here. No, actually, it's not. It's not channel one, so it'd be be probably equivalent to about uh, ten hertz. That that's channel two, so it's somewhere between five and ten hertz, somewhere in there. Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't say that at all. No, I, I'm just. I haven't. Uh, haven't interpreted the, definitely you can see the direction from the cross holes. Could I interrupt this uh, conversation? Because we're going to be, we have a whole session on borehole uh, later today, and uh, all these people are going to be speaking, and they can address all these issues, all right? Uh, Leo, you got a time? Yeah, question? Sure. Do you want the mic? Oh, okay. Thank you, Dennis. At last, we have a floor mic, at least for those sitting up front. So, Sid, you showed a, a plot, a comparison of the noise of a bunch of different magnetic sensors, and you said that was done in Utah a couple of years ago, something like that? Yeah. Uh, what was the uh, the occasion of that, and is that publicly available? Uh, I don't know if it's publicly available. We uh, There was a consortium of companies and people that, that were uh, involved in it. So we actually uh, paid to have a group do this. And so I am not sure. The, the best person to talk to would be probably John Kingman. You know John Kingman? Yeah. Yeah, talk yeah. to John. He'll, he'll let you know. Yeah, interesting plot. Didn't have any Phoenix coils there. <laughs> Did you, was there any there? Not shown, no. Hmm. Well, you probably didn't pony up and send your coils. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bob, thank you very much. <laughs>